Hello. in DeMott and Rensselaer. We serve all of Jasper County except for Carpenter Terrace. And we have a population, we serve a population according to the 90 census of something over 23,000. So 23,000 instead of 2,300. Uh, the library was formally opened September 4th, 1905, and what I felt was strange was that there was nothing in the newspaper about it. They had the, they had the, the cornerstone laying, and they had a parade, and they had people coming in from everywhere, and they had all the ceremonies. Um, oh, I didn't bring my favorite headline. That's okay. Uh, but, I mean, it was a whole page of the paper talking about the cornerstone laying, but when they actually opened the library, there was no fanfare. There was not even an article in the paper. Um, but they opened with 3,000 books from the former Jasper Public Library. Various organizations and individuals donated books to the library. One thing that I thought was interesting was that in 1950, the Rensselaer schools decided that they were going to start a library again. And so they asked the Rensselaer Public Library if they would please return the book. <laughs> <laughs> in about 1900 for the Jasper Library, and I'm wondering how many of those books would have been still useful in 1950. But we voted to do it. We gave the books back. <laughs> Bessie L. King was the first librarian. She served for an annual salary of $400. And with that $400, she also had to pay for any clerical help that she might need. At the beginning, the library was open continuously, no, didn't close for dinner or lunch or anything, continuously from 10 in the morning until 9 at night, Monday through Saturday, and from 2 to 5 on Sunday. So that was 69 hours that she was scheduled to work or pay somebody out of her $400 salary. Right now, there are only about 15 li 16 libraries in the state of Indiana out of 238 that are open that many hours because it's, it's just not feasible anymore um, with the, the different services. At that time, she had to check out books to people. One person could do that. Now, there are so many other things that, that we need to do that it takes more than one person to run a library at a time, and that's too expensive to operate 69 hours. A week. Records show that at the end of the first year, the library owned over 4,000 volumes. So they <coughs> added 1,000 volumes one way or another in that in that first year. Presently, Rensselaer has about 40, close to 49,000 volumes, and our our library system, Jasper County Library, has 110,000. They had a circulation of 14,450 books that year. And just to compare it with, with now, Rensselaer last year had a circulation of 92,000. I was interested to see that, that this was an average of about 40 books checked out a day. And I thought, gee, what would you do all day if all you had to do was check out 40 books? And I'm sure there are a lot of things that you know, I have no idea of that she did. But it was the board. At that time, the library board, who was unpaid as they are now, um, selected the books and the magazines for the library, and I think they told the librarian to order them. But they were the ones in charge of the building repairs, and if, if um, you know, new equipment had to be uh, purchased, why they were in charge of, of all of these things. They hired the janitor. So the librarian had a very different job then from, from the librarian's job now when the staff handles all of these duties. And the Rensselaer Library checks in it out an average of about 350 books a day. Yesterday it was 500 and something. Last year our three libraries checked out 251,000 items to um, library users. Well, Miss King, who later became Mrs. Tillman, was allowed to close the library for three holidays. Um, have any idea which ones those would be? <laughs> Christmas, yeah. Thanksgiving. Fourth of July. Fourth of July, that was it. Yeah. And and then about a year later I noticed that they asked her if she would please open the library back up um, in the afternoon on the fourth of July. <laughs> well the salary sounds bad, but 
But then I found out that the average public school teacher at that time made about $392 a year. So, um, it was, it was, what, the hours? Yeah, a lot fewer hours. Well, over the years, the library hours gradually were shortened and the number of holidays gradually increased. It wasn't long before library assistants were hired. In 1908, they hired a, a part-time librarian to catalog the collection, catalog the books, and to stay on until all the books were cataloged. So my feeling is that before that, um, they were just books on the shelf. And at that time, they decided these books should all be cataloged, and then they, they took care of that. And then after that, they didn't catalog them anymore, because in 1925, there was again a push to begin cataloging library materials. So, so it looks as if it was something that was done from time to time when, when someone felt that you know, it was necessary. Um, by 1931, though, besides Ida Milliken, who was the librarian then, there was a full-time assistant, Mrs. Etta Hemphill. Although some of her predecessors had some library training, Barbara Fisher, who was hired in 1965, was the first librarian, though part-time, to have a master's degree in library science and have an Indiana, have Indiana certification at the, the proper level for, um, for this library. And then Terry Hockey, who started working 11 years later, was the first full-time librarian to be certified and to have a master's degree in library science. Since then, all of the directors of the library have had to have the master's degree. Well, in the early 1900s, as I said, it looks as if the library existed really to provide books and magazines for library users. The library also was heavily supportive of the schools. Um, they, they worked, they gave books to the schools to, for their classrooms, and they also worked closely with the teachers and the students um, in the library. And, um, okay, then in 1931, they actually established stations, book stations, at two consolidated schools. And they would take the books to those book stations, and then the teachers would check them out to the, to the children at the schools. Um, Beulah, would you like to tell something about Ida Milliken? <laughs> Beulah said, Ida Milliken was such a big part of this library and its history for a number of years that she thought that we ought to know more about her. Well, I'm sure there are people here that remember Ida about as well as I do. But um, in order to uh, talk about Ida, you need to know how the library was set up. And um, these steps that I labored to get up and down, back in those days I could run up and down just by the <laughs> But you didn't run up and down the steps in front of Ida Milliken. <laughs> her her uh, desk was right in front of those double doors. And uh, you walked up and she was sitting there, and if you made too much noise, she saw to it that you quieted down. And it was always very quiet. You go into the library now, you're pretty free to talk and, and visit, and, and uh, I even saw some children running in the library. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Ida was a cousin of Aura Thompson Ross. She came from the East. And uh, she was the librarian here. I guess she wasn't uh, uh, certified, but uh, she uh, did uh, perform the duty of a librarian. And one of the things I remember about her, and all the librarians, and Lynn and I talked about this the other day, how we envied this wonderful pencil she had that had a date on the end of it. And uh, you would bring your library card in, and she turned that pencil over and stamped the date on it. And that just was fascinating. I just wanted one of those so badly. <laughs> Stamp dates on things. Um, before I go any further, the, uh, the library that was housed in the courthouse just prior to building this one, the librarian was Stella Parkinson. And her daughter is with me tonight, uh, Mary uh, Ketchum Fraser. Stella Parkinson became Stella Ketchum. 
and this is her daughter, Mary. It's with me tonight. And so that goes back a long time, too. <laughs> what? Let me tell you about the... You're not ready for the arrangement. No. Okay. <laughs> I do it with items. <laughs> The room that we're in here was the auditorium, and this wall was not was not in here. But this auditorium was used very heavily by community groups and by the schools. But the library didn't present its own programs here at, in those early years. It was the community that did. And I put an article up on one of those bullet boards there that um, interested me. It, it was talking. It was written in October of 1905, and it said that the library board was trying to get people or notify people that this room was available for them, and it said something about 350 chairs that had been ordered, <laughs> or 200, 230, 230 I think it's 230 chairs that were ordered. And, and, no. I don't know. You'll have to look and see it. One of those two, either one of those, I don't think. Even though the, this, you know, even if this wall were not here, I don't think they could. But that's what it said. Um, today, good, good library service is considered to be a lot more than providing books and providing a room for meetings. Today, if we don't have something that a person wants in our library, why we search other libraries? Um, that's just, you know just part of what you do. Uh, we actively publicize the library services. We provide programs for adults and for children, both in the library and then going out into the community. And we do what we can to encourage people to read and use the library. And we offer a lot more formats than just books and magazines and newspapers. What I was interested in was when did this all change? When did the change in the library's role take place? And and what drove that change. And the first indication that I could find in the board minute books of a change in the idea of what a library was supposed to do was a report made by then librarian Etta Hemphill in December 1949 when she told about a successful, a successful book week held at the library and the increased interest in, in reading, especially among the children. And from then it just seemed to, slow, uh, to snowball. Um, could we? Yeah, get the license. Now, I don't know whether Ms. Hampill was just this creative ball of fire, or, or whether there was someone on the board who was, or whether all of these meetings, state meetings and workshops, which they seem to have even back then that they went to, um, were giving them ideas. But whatever, big changes started to happen about that time. Within the next few months, the library began advertising. Um, okay, library began advertising its book rental service. They had rented books to people who lived out in the other townships ever since they opened, but they they never apparently advertised this much. But they started advertising this, and then in '52, she started having. Um, reading courses which sound like our summer reading programs with a puppet show at the end and you know a party for the kids that kind of thing and then in 1958 the library bought a, a sofa and chairs and a lamp and put a table there and made what they called a, a cozy corner which um, actually invited visiting in the library now this isn't to say that library users before that time didn't visit in the library, but they weren't supposed to visit. And Beulah was telling, this is something else I want Beulah to tell us about, because she was telling me about um, the social aspects and benefits of using the library as a teenager. And, and I, I'm thinking this is something that hasn't changed a bit, and I thought maybe you, you'd like to tell us about Well, that's very short, but... Um, um, I'm not going to even stand. You can hear me, can't you? Um, we used to use the library as an excuse to get out at night. We had to go to the library to study. <laughs> and we'd come to the library and people like Zadok would be here and Wadro and, and Bill and Red and Buck. and uh, It was just a good place to meet. And then if Those were all it, men you were talking about. All yeah, boys. yeah, that's all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there was Martha and oh, Beth okay. and Mary and, okay. and a few others that would come down. 
Um, and then if you had a nickel, you went to the luggage restroom afterwards. But it was used just as a meeting place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it still is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a book drop was purchased for the for users' convenience when the library was closed, and then in 1960 the library started having what they called coffees or punch parties for for teachers at the beginning of the school year. Uh, in 1962 they had summer adult reading classes uh, every Wednesday evening, and and a high school reading class every day. I, we couldn't get high school. It's hard to get high school kids in the library. And then the, the school systems library during this time? The, if they started up again in about 1950 or so. Still going? Yeah, I, yeah, I think from then on they probably continued. Didn't they continue their yeah, school, their library, school libraries? Yeah. And in 1963, the librarian even had a radio program every Sunday. <laughs> so all of a sudden, things are, are happening. In 1966, the library hired a, a full-time children's librarian, Aileen Smith. Hmm. Um, now, comparing, though, what was done way back, not in the 60s, but before that, to now, the Rensselaer Library just this year has ha already had 230 programs for adults, teens, children. That's counting each story hour and toddler time and, and visit to the schools when they go and read in the classrooms and, and other kinds of programs. But Sharon's going to talk. Sharon <coughs> is, is the person that's been in charge of, of scheduling adult programs in the library for quite a while. And Sharon is going to talk about a few of the excellent programs that the library has offered over the years. I looked at that in bold print. Sharon would like to talk, and I thought, oops, I... <laughs> well, let me see. Um, in, recent, um, in recent months, we had a uh, six-week class that was rather exciting. We had a, a sign language class, and we're contemplating continuing with that class. We had an unreal number of people in this uh, area who have been interested in sign language. We never would have dreamt it. You know, when you go to plan a program, no matter how much effort and work you put into it, um, you never know whether you're going to get one person to show up or whether you may have 50. But we have been really, um, we've worked hard. We've had all kinds of, of programming uh, from cake decorating to um, pet care and and uh, quilting classes and uh, how to write your own, how to write a will and, and that type of thing. Um, for children's programming in the summer, the summer reading program has brought pet, pet day and that kind of thing. I can remember Aileen Smith having pet day outside of this library building back in the 60s, yeah, early, or late 60s I guess I should say. And I remember how funny it was. The ch children could bring either a live pet or a, or a stuffed animal if they didn't have their own pet. And it was just hysterical that day because the animals, of course, were outside. But the little tiny dogs were s scaring tremendously the great big. <laughs> it, it was a, a real zoo, but it, it was fun. So, um, I don't know. It, we're always open to suggestions for programming, but we, we've done everything from from soup to nuts, but there's just <laughs> a whole world out there. So, um, Can you think of any, Lynn, that you'd like to? Yeah. Mary's got a comment back. Okay. I, I just wonder, how do you go about it? Do you get an idea and then just look all over for someone to present it, or do you find a presenter and think, now, it there's a subject both, we'd like, or a little each? It can you can work do? both ways. Well, sometimes the sign language class came from a gentleman who for two years begged, please have a class. And we finally located a couple that was willing to do it for us. And sometimes um, someone may come in and say, oh, I have this interest in model railroading, and I'd love to share my hobby. But sometimes it's our own ideas that are just pulled together at the beginning of the uh, year or whatever, and now we have programming to do, and what would be something that we possibly haven't tried that might be of interest. So it can come from, from you, and it can, sometimes it comes from, from our 
Like you said, it's, we never know. That's always Butterfly Day for me. <laughs> never know how many are going to walk in the door, but it's always exciting. Well, one another thing that we do do the brown or brown bag group chats oh, have been nice. lots of fun. And sometimes staff will do those, and sometimes patrons will do them. Sharing what we all enjoy, our love of books. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I haven't been mentioned yet about the bookmobile. No, and, and I I had a whole section in my speech about that, and then I just, I thought, now they said the Renson Maternity Library, oh. <laughs> so I cut it all out. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a county school, and I was glad it came out there. Right, because this... the opportunity to get out of class. Yeah, this, <laughs> <laughs> this library only served Marion Township and Rensselaer. And then in 64, 62, I think it was, um, there was a federal program uh, that provided, they would buy you a big bookmobile and, and you would arrange, in this case it was Jasper and Newton counties together, and we would arrange a schedule to send this bookmobile around and we had some book stations also that were set up various places around the county where we thought there were enough people for an actual station. And um, this operated on federal funds for three years. And then at the end of the three years, we had to go to your county council or commissioners, I forget, both probably, and get them to say, yes, we'll pay a tax for, um, for this service so that we can continue the service. And this county, there was absolutely no opposition. Uh, they said, they said, we'll do it. People said, great. And, and so that became, that's what the Jasper County Contractual Library is. That, that was the out, of the out of Marion Township part of the library. And, when, and they only paid a tax of maybe four cents or three cents or five cents, while Marion Township and Rensselaer paid a tax of 11 or 12 cents. For library service, but um, but this was a, a wonderful thing for for the county. And my library in Mar I was in Martinsville at that same time, and and I was doing the same thing down there that you folks were doing here because we got a bookmobile project going down there. So all around the state, this was a big there was a big push to extend library service. How long did the bookmobile exist? Until seventy. I think it was in 70, um, 72, they finally decided that it had to be replaced and there wasn't money to, for that huge expenditure for a big bookmobile. So they decided at that point that they couldn't do the bookmobile, they would have to um, have actual libraries and that's when the DeMott, well actually DeMott had a station before that, but the Wheatfield Library started right then. Um, Another reason was that the bookmobile had chronic repair for <laughs> repair and, oh. and it just was getting a lot of miles on it and it was getting to be yeah, it was just getting too costly. Yeah. Yeah. I see I was gonna leave that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember that as late as nineteen seventy nine, library users were limited for the most part to the books that were in our collection. I was talking about interlibrary loan. I was really shocked to find out that it wasn't until 79 that we thought about contacting other libraries for materials if, if materials weren't in our library. But that was when, um, well, that was when an organization was formed in the state that made this possible, made it possible for us to cooperate and to get materials from other libraries. Now our life interlibrary loan service is used so heavily that we're getting books in, and this is this is Sharon's job. Sharon is our interlibrary loan person. Uh, we get books in almost every day from all over the country. Just Boston wow. Public Library or Salt Lake City or it's, wherever. It's Christmas on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. Yes. Yeah, we heard talking about the past librarians. I think something she was out, Mrs. Scantlin, because I was like, remember, she was in the library. And I remember after I was married to a child, I came back to the library to get a book. And it was, you know, not a real dirty book, but you know, I it, and she said, oh, honey, you shouldn't read something like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
and you were married at that time. Oh, yeah, I was married and children. <laughs> 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 is there anyone else who wants to say anything about that? She <coughs> had told me that she was a very special person, too. She really, she really was. She was a, I guess, a typical stereotype of a librarian with the hair brought back into a bun and the glasses on the end, end, end of the nose because they were held on to, you know, the, the chain. And, <laughs> and, uh, but she, and she had a French accent. She was a very endearing lady, just a, just a lovely lady. And when I started at the library in 1968, she certainly made me feel very much at home. But she knew everybody and she cared about everybody. There are pictures of her over on, on the bulletin board there when, when she left and, and they uh, donated a picture to the library in her honor. And, and so there are pictures of her up there. And, and I didn't know her. That's, that's as much as I know. I see Ralph Fendix in the audience tonight. Uh, the picture was commissioned by the, the library right. board and, and is in the, in the present library. It's just beautiful. But Ralph's wife painted that picture. Right. Uh, Marcia, did you have a comment? Well, I was just going to say that when we found out what kind of, which book Mrs. Hampel disapproved of and put under the desk, we went to great pains to see if we could get it. <laughs> 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 Marcia, I mean, Beulah did. I did. <laughs> provided these 1,679 libraries across the U.S. and put books into the hands of, of those who couldn't afford them. He really transformed the country. Um, immigrants were able to assimilate more easily. Economic growth was um, fostered by this. And, and youngsters turned into readers and informed citizens. Today we're beginning a new venture that could transform the nation again by giving people access to electronically delivered information. And I think that it's interesting to see where this started, too. Um, we, the, the beginning of it, I guess, was the telephone. And the telephone was installed here in January of 1906, right at the... I take the other part off, yeah. Um, right at when we first opened. In about 1956, we added an extension phone down here in the, in the auditorium. Uh, no big deal. <laughs> and, and then we, we got a new dial system in 1961. Now in our new building, we have multiple phone lines coming into the building, and, and we have numerous extensions. And when we go over there, I'll show you the electrical room so you can see where the telephone, what the telephone service looks like now. The library purchased its first typewriter in 1923, and then it replaced it in 1966. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a typewriter that would last that long now, I would be interested. Except that 
we don't have very many typewriters in the library anymore. We have mostly computers now. In 1952, they purchased their first adding machine. And this was not just a, a light purchase. This was a big deal. The library board discussed it, and somebody on the board was appointed to look into this, and they finally decided to do it and purchased an adding machine. Now we have, we have little inexpensive um, calculators on <clears throat> every desk in the library, practically. In 1968, we got our, our, our projector. Photocopying was in 1970. I had that in the wrong time, <clears throat> time slot. We had an art prints in 1974. Um, in the 60s, we, had, we added phonograph records. And then pretty soon we had film strips and um, slide projectors available for public use. For a short while in the 80s, we even had a video camera that was available for public use. <clears throat> now, of course, we have audio cassettes and videos were added. Now we have CDs, um, which people borrow. But you see, if you look at that list, that everything's happened after 1950 or so. Um, in the 1980s, we, we got a microfilm reader printer so that we could have access to our local newspapers and, um, and census, censuses. Skipping over some of these things. Um, fax machine, that was a big, a big move. That was something where the board had to stew over that, you know, was this something we really needed? Was this something really valuable? And now, I can't imagine operating without a fax machine. And people have fax machines even in their homes now. We use them for, for getting information. If we have material at one library that a patron at another library needs, we can fax it to them very quickly. And we use it to communicate with each other. In the early years, uh, books were checked out just by writing your name on a book card. And in 1966, then, the library, the library first installed a mechanical book charging machine. Then, of course, when we moved to the new building, we, we, we moved to an automated library system that uses computers to do everything. It uses computers to register patrons and to check materials in and out, um, to reserve books, and as a superb substitute for the card catalog, some of you would disagree with that. Uh, but this created huge changes uh, in the way you use the library and the way we use it. Now you can stand at a, at a computer terminal and you can find out, you know, you type in a, a title, you find out who the author is, you can find out if the book's on the shelf all while you're standing there. Um, actually, you can reserve the book while you're standing there. For us, we no longer need card catalogs. And that means that we've saved hours and hours and hours of filing cards. Uh, filing book cards, too, from the, the books that are checked out. We don't have to do that anymore. Inventory is very simple and quick. Information is, is more readily accessible. And what's more, if you have a computer and a modem in your home, you can actually access that, that the card catalog, so to speak, from your home. Now we're talking about CD-ROM networks, and we're talking about access to the internet. We're going to have both of those for the public by spring. Uh, we're planning for dial-in access to our networks from your homes and your offices and, the, and schools within probably the next year or two. In February, we're going to be starting circulating CD-ROMs. What, what drove all of these changes? It seems like everything happened so fast um, in the last 20 or 30 years. I think one, one factor is improved communication. Maybe that extension phone was the, was the beginning of it, I don't know. <laughs> but communi as communication became cheaper and easier, I mean, I don't think that Miss King, back in 1905, if she couldn't find information that she needed, I don't think that she would have called up the, the library in Merrillville to get information. I think that long distance phone calls were something that you thought a long time before making. And now, now it's nothing because it isn't as expensive as it used to be. I think that TV, of course, made a big difference because 
you see what's available other places and, and you want it for yourself. I think that maybe, um, well probably, as trained librarians came into the libraries, they'd been to library school, they found out what all these other libraries are doing, and they brought all of this information with them to their boards, and the boards wanted to offer some of these services that they heard about. So I think that would make a big difference. And then the information explosion had to be a big part of it. In 1905, there were only 8,112 books published. But in 1994, there were 51,863. And that's books. I think it's probably even a bigger difference uh, with magazines. And then, of course, now there's so much publishing right on the internet. It's just an explosion. There's just more information out there than there ever was. And we're, we're running to try to find ways to gather this information and to be able to tap into it for, for people. Um, today, if I don't know how to handle a problem, I can join an internet mailing list and <coughs> sit down at my computer in the morning and type in my question, and the next day I'll probably have five or ten answers from, from librarians anywhere in the world to my, to my question. So everything is, is just moving faster and faster and information's exploding faster and faster and people are wanting information up to date. We had a, a, a fact-finding meeting about two years ago. We invited business people in the community to come in and talk to us about what they wanted from the library, what their needs were, what their information needs were, and what they all said was they want up-to-the-minute accurate information. And that's what they wanted us to try to get for them. And, and print information, other than the daily newspapers, is not up to date. Um, they say when a book is printed, it's, it's a year <coughs> out of date at that, at that time. Um, yeah? All the Carnegie buildings, are they all called Carnegie? Or are they different names? No, this one isn't even called the Carnegie Library. This is called... I mean, this never was called the Carnegie Library. It was the Rensselaer Public Library. <coughs> Carnegie wasn't somebody with an ego. He said that he would never ask that, you know, some people, when they give money, they want their picture, you know, over the fireplace kind of thing. He said he would never ask that, that his picture be in the libraries that he built. You know, he didn't... But it is. What? But it is. But it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, is there a national monument for bust or, or portrait of Mr. Carnegie any place in the nation? I've seen I've seen busts of him. I'm sure that there are. I I don't know where they are. Does anybody know of any? I know I've seen busts of him in various places. When you get internet, you can find out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, okay, the building. The architect for this building was Charles R. Weatherhog from, from Fort Wayne. He was born and educated in England, but he came over here in 1892 to go to the Chicago World Fair, and he was so impressed he just decided he wanted to make his home here. So he did. And he joined um, Mr. Grindle and formed the firm of Grindle and Weather Weatherhog. And if you, if you were involved in the courthouse, uh, centennial celebration, you will recognize Grindle as the architect for the courthouse. So it was his partner that designed this library. The building contractors were Rust and Warren from Rensselaer, and Carnegie gave $10,000 originally, and then he gave $2,000 more for furnishings and equipment um, for the building. The building is Hobart Press Brick, and it an architect said this was in a buff color. That's not what I call buff, but in a buff color with limestone trim. And it's designed in a neoclassical style with an eclectic selection of motifs, <laughs> including entablatures and pediments that are mostly Renaissance. And I know what they are, because I love them. <laughs> um, we're in an English basement here. It's, it's about five feet underground and five feet above ground. 
and the building has a mono pitch roof, which means actually in this case it's pretty much flat, but it slopes a little bit to the rear. Um, and the upper windows have full width transoms with muntins. Those little cross, those decorative cross um, pieces in the windows are called muntins. That's the extent of what I know architecturally here. The cornerstone, which hasn't been opened yet and, and does have things in it, is a solid cube of uh, Blue Bedford limestone, and it was carved by W.H. Mackey, uh, a local stone cutter. There have only been a few substantive changes to the building. Um, and I think we could turn the lights back on probably now. I think I think that this that the Jasper Foundation has is making plans. It would be it would be in 2005. Um, there was a, a a framed vestibule added at the back of the building, and the, the glass doors, um, the glass doors that are on the front of the building now were not the, obviously the original doors. Uh, this building had skylights, <coughs> which were removed when the when the ceilings were lowered, and then this wall in here is a was a big change. This basement has really has four rooms in it. Yes, uh, The boiler room. And then the two rooms across the hall were called unpacking rooms. And then this was the auditorium or assembly room. <coughs> now at the end, but right before we moved out of it, this was the children's library. And then on the other side of the wall was a small meeting room. Uh, there was finished wood flooring down here in this room and in the front unpacking room. But the rest of the basement was, uh, had a cement floor. Fairly early in the library's life, they, they built an eight-foot um, platform on that end of the building and added a, added a piano. And this room, as I said, was very important to the community. Managing it took a considerable amount of time of board at the beginning, and the regulations were changed again and again through the years. In the, beginnings, in the beginning, they charged anywhere from $1.50 to $5 per meeting to use this room, depending on whether the group charged admission or not, and whether it was nighttime meeting or daytime meeting, and summer or winter. Well, in our daytime, in, in considering the difference in the value of the dollar, a $5 meeting then, I think, would be about $75 now. So it was pretty, um, some pretty stiff <laughs> charges to use the meeting room in the very beginning. The library charged the city schools $150 a year to use the room for classes. And uh, <clears throat> charges fluctuated through the years. The, the school used the room, I think, at the beginning, and then I don't think they used it for a long time. And then, um, and then they started using it again in the 50s. Now, the auditorium was used by many groups, education and literary societies. There were vocal training classes here. In 1933, Ms. Esther Arnott was allowed to use the auditorium for a kindergarten class. Uh, the class met here from 9 to 11 in the mornings, and, and she paid a dollar, a dollar a week to use it. Do you want to say any more about well, <coughs> my sister, of course, and yeah. um, um, people that were in that class, I think the Halleck twins were a part of her class. And um, uh, the Nesbitt girl, I can't think, but uh, she ran the kindergarten and my other sister helped her. My other sister was not uh, inclined to like little children very much. <laughs> <laughs> One day Esther was sick and sent Florence over to run the kindergarten and the kids all went home by about 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and then Clea Beeman had a third grade class down here for I don't know how many years. Is that uh, in the 50s, you, you mean? Probably about three. Mm -hmm. About three years. In the 50s? Is that, was that when mm -hmm. they were here in the 50s? Okay. And, and then they were charged $150 a year, and that was in 1954, and that would have been a lot less than um, in the earlier years. But it, the prices went down and down over the years, I think. In 1959, they decided that this auditorium ought to be free to people who um, 
lived in, in Rensselaer and Marion Township, and they only charge people outside of the township. In 1930, Mr. Edson Murray, and that would be Edson Murray Sr., I think, presented the idea of, <coughs> excuse me, providing more room down here in some way, and then still creating a child library down here. And there was a board committee that was set up to, to figure out how to do this, but it never happened. It was 1963 before this was actually turned into a children's library. And um, Sharon, you might want to show the picture of, in 1976, we added a carpeted bathtub to our children's room here. Uh, it was donated by William Axon and carpeted inside and then <coughs> painted by library staff. And the kids loved it. They just loved to sit in it. Uh, we did have to get rid of it after a while. And, um, <laughs> it got lights. <laughs> and this, this white spot in the middle of the room here, this was our loft. And we had a little loft that the kids could climb up into and read or listen to cassettes. <coughs> At the present time, our meeting rooms are free to uh, and available to any group as long as admission isn't charged. Not to individuals, but to groups, as long as admission isn't charged and, and as long as it's not used for political or money-making purposes. And now we're going to go on a quick tour of this building, and then we'll go over to the other building, get some refreshments, and then take a tour of that building. Um, and I think the first place we're going to go, one of my favorite rooms, the boiler room. <laughs> so if you want to...